Good morning. Morning. You've all seen the title of my talk. I'd like to simplify it a little bit. You'll be working with other people. Good morning. Thank you, Vic, for the introduction. Thank you all for being here uh, and for making space for me to be here with all of you. Some of you I recognize from other conferences, some of you are friends to me, and many of you are new, so this is very, very exciting. Some of the reasons I love the Postgres community are an openness to new ideas, excitement to work together, the desire, of course, to create and improve a system that we all use. That's why we're here, right? And of course, I know you all appreciate hard work, and because I know you appreciate that, my slides will be available on the PG Day Paris um, YouTube channel. This will be a link in the slides. So go ahead and subscribe, and you will be able to uh, help us get that name that we want and not Vic's password. So of course today I'm going to talk about community, working together and improving our community even more than we already have. So first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. I did an undergraduate study in medical anthropology with a personal interest in where work and leisure also collide. And of course, you all know that that happens for us a lot here in the big world of technology because we enjoy what we're doing, but we also have some responsibilities. So what I studied was ways to improve the communication between doctors and patients in the US. And because there are more patients than doctors, it was easier to try and help doctors learn because it's hard to reach all the patients. So then I moved on to other fields, and I helped sales teams, medical office staff, and manufacturers communicate internally and externally. And through all of this, I kept noticing a pattern. And that pattern was that there isn't always space for people to join much less contribute or get their needs met in some organizations and spaces. And this was really frustrating to me. So we're here in a community-minded group today. This is a previous PJ Day Paris picture. And this talk is for everyone, because as you might have gathered from my editing of the title, we all work and we all work with people. Whether we work at a large corporation or we're a single consultant with a single customer, or we're fresh out of school and interviewing, we are all working. And we're all working with people in some way. So inclusion in the workplace has been a topic for a long time. I'm not the first person to suggest this, um, and I'm not the first person to um, be aware of this. You may have seen suggested uh, responses to absences in the workplace. And if you're part of an underrepresented group, I'm pretty sure you've received advice about how to break in and how to make it, whether in tech or in school or in any other arena. So today, I have to talk generally about my own experience because there are so many groups that I don't belong to, and I don't claim to represent every member of the groups that I do belong to. I do want to normalize conversations about identity, so I will tell you that I'm a currently able-bodied, straight, white, cisgender woman. Some of these identities do come with a lot of privilege and protection, and that has given me access to a lot of spaces that aren't easily open to other people. And yet, there have been times through the years that I have been made aware that I don't fit into all the spaces that I want to join. I find myself belonging to an overrepresented group and underrepresented group at the same time. So from experience, I can report to you that members of underrepresented groups face pressure to get into, prove that we belong, not make others around us uncomfortable, and to change the spaces that are not welcoming to us. This is a lot of extra invisible work on top of how hard it can be to gain consideration even for some roles, much less, again, get in. For a long time, I spent a lot of energy imagining a place where I would be welcome and comfortable. And I also spent a lot of energy trying to change myself to be what organizations tacitly demanded. Assertive, but not too loud. Helpful, but not a doormat. 
These conflicting pieces of advice are often backed up by dubious studies, like one done by Amy Cuddy of Harvard Business School, or popular books by Sheryl Sandberg. Amy Cuddy's 2012 talk about power poses and her later book titled Presence created a sensation, and she relies on research that has not been replicated. The gist of it is that a negotiation will go better if a person is confident, and this confidence can be boosted by making power poses, like this, or like this. Of course, in private. Like this. Um, Cuddy does not discuss the power of the implicit biases of our negotiating partners. Instead, her focus is on the benefit of taking up space. Sheryl Sandberg wrote Lean In, and many people have interpreted her book to mean that women who aren't in leadership positions have chosen not to pursue that path. This doesn't match the reality that leadership roles in many companies are still not open to people who aren't gendered as men or who aren't white. And when they are in these roles, it's often in the trap of the glass cliff. Even in nursing, a predominantly female field, the vast, vast majority of management positions are held by men. So the assertion that there aren't enough junior women to promote rings hollow. Because of Amy Cuddy and Sheryl Sandberg, I think a lot in terms of space-taking gestures now when I think about where I work and where I play. Who is leaning in? What is the difference between a position of power and a power pose? These concepts have led me to a series of questions that I'd like to explore with you. Among my answers to these questions, we'll find some tools, some sites, and some concepts that are going to help us work through um, working with people from different backgrounds. So these questions are, who do I want to attract to my spaces? What do I want to do in the spaces that I use? What do I not want to do in the spaces that I use? And finally, who is on the front lines of creating these spaces? So let's walk through these questions and explore the challenges and the fun of working with other people. Who do I want to attract to my spaces? I want to be in diverse, inclusive, and truly welcoming places. Teams with different perspectives consider more possible uses for products, broaden the problem-solving skills available, and encourage more creative approaches to work. These spaces also attract and retain better talent. The Williams Institute reviewed 36 studies that include findings related to the impact of LGBT supportive policies or workplace climates on business outcomes, and they found many benefits to employers when LGBT supportive policies are in place. Additionally, I want to be in spaces that are safe for everyone. Postgres has a new code of conduct. This is new as of 2018, and the full code of conduct is available on the website um, for PG Day Paris. The biggest highlight here is that there is always a safe place for you to address any concerns if something inappropriate does happen at this event or others. You can report something that you witness, even if it's not directed at you. So here are the kinds of people that I want to join me in every journey. I want to attract folks of every and any gender, orientation, color, first language, religion, or socioeconomic background to think about and work on hard problems with me and near me. And it's critical to me that the people that I surround myself with be as enthusiastic about growing themselves as they are about debugging code or selling a product. So according to a study by Michelle Moore Barak and some other people listed in alphabetical order, uh, 
There was a survey that they distributed to over 6,500 employees uh, at a large, older, unnamed tech company. And they received back 2,500 completed questionnaires, which indicated that Caucasian men um, didn't feel as good about diversity as women and men and women of color. So it's no surprise that I want diversity, as this same study cites previous findings that humans have a pronounced tendency to prefer to interact with people that we perceive as like ourselves. Researchers call this interpersonal similarity. And Moore Barak's study only collected information about race and ethnicity as well as gender. So they can't speak to physical ability or sexuality. But further research has shown that this holds as well. We want more people who look like ourselves. So if we're the only person who looks like ourselves, we get lonely. We know this. I also want to talk about generosity. One woman I know cleans the hard drives of older computers and shares them with new learners. And this act of generosity creates a connection between her and the young people who can use that working machine that would otherwise be gathering dust. I want this to be inspiring on both sides of the gift. Other ways to be generous include a monetary donation to organizations that support diversity in tech, whether they're Postgres-specific or more general. In fact, it's through donations that organizations like the US Postgres Diversity Committee and Postgres Women are able to fund educational opportunities, and how Postgres EU is able to help subsidize travel for some speakers. Some of the funds that come from sponsors and supporters are earmarked for diversity efforts, but you'll notice that they're not loud about it. It's often anonymous. So now the next question is, what do I want to do in my spaces? At work, I want to be able to concentrate when I need to. So of course, I want to encourage working. I also want to encourage asking questions and sharing relevant bits of news and pop culture. I want to make jokes and laugh when it's appropriate. I also want to be able to have all of my human feelings without hiding in the bathroom. And speaking of bathrooms, why does it take a woman an average of 180 seconds to complete a trip through a public restroom, and men an average of 90 seconds to complete the same trip? Well, it's often not the same trip. Women are more likely to be helping other people, children or elderly companions. And cis women often have potential personal tasks in the bathroom. Additionally, men's bathrooms tend to have an additional option that doesn't involve a possible malfunctioning door latch. This also, as a urinal, maximizes floor space. In the late 1980s, a solution to this problem of bathroom time was to increase the size of women's restrooms relative to men's restrooms in sports stadiums, thus increasing the um, number of transactions per minute. In American bathrooms, we have a source of other conversations, notably who gets to use the bathroom and who gets to decide. In the past, this was a race issue, and now it's a gender identity issue. In many workplaces, bathrooms are identical because they're single occupant, and they don't need to be gendered, but often they are. Bathrooms for multiple occupants might be described by whether there are toilets, urinals, or both, instead of who is invited in. Not everybody on the gender spectrum feels the same way, but Many people do appreciate bathroom signage that is welcoming and inclusive, rather than excluding. So what I want from you is when the bathroom topic comes up, just say, people should use the bathroom that they feel comfortable using. And I hope that space can make it easy as possible. Whether bathrooms are separated by gender or not, if there are menstruation supplies in one bathroom, I know this is controversial and hard to talk about, but we got to do it. Please ask that there be supplies in all bathrooms. Men who menstruate may not be comfortable asking in case of an expected need, but they also might be. 
bathrooms aren't just about gender. How is the bathroom organized for people who use assistive devices like canes, walkers, or wheelchairs? At what height are the soap and drying devices located? Please arrange to have these potential problem areas fixed before you have a wheelchair user interview in your space. Being unable to use the toilets is a great reason to refuse a job offer. Of course, if the rest of your office is not accessible, a great bathroom is not going to save you. From the entrance to the work and meeting spaces, potential obstacles should be addressed. Now, I don't just want to share tangible things and tangible spaces. I also am talking about networking, job postings, praise, and credit. There's a very famous cartoon that I can't use a photo of because it's copyrighted, but you may have seen it. It's some people sitting at a conference table. It's like five men and one woman. And the caption is, that's a great idea, Ms. Triggs. Is there a man in the room who'd like to say that? And it's really disheartening to have our ideas taken by other people and not credited to us. So that's why I'm respecting the copyright of that image, as funny as it is. Um, it's really important that when someone comes up with a good idea, we give them the spotlight for it. And efforts for diversity and inclusion don't end with having a variety of people in the room. Everyone must be heard. Many companies fall into a pattern of looking for employees in consistent ways. Whether it's one founder's alma mater or a particular job posting service. But limiting visibility doesn't encourage increased applicant numbers. And it definitely hinders diverse applicants from finding your postings. Send your recruiters to on campus job fairs for various schools, post on the Postgres mailing lists, and send volunteer mentors to training programs to encourage younger people to join you. Now, if you belong to social groups that hold gatherings, please look for more places to share information about your meeting. Colleges often have notice boards. Consider coffee shops. And of course, other tech meetups might give you a space to talk about your tech meetup. A large part of this is also that sharing goes both ways. Being willing to receive is often really hard. We may not feel deserving. Perhaps there might be someone out there who needs the help or the attention more. I can say, though, if you are a member of an underrepresented group and resources and opportunities are available to you, take them and let everybody know that you received them. This works to normalize these benefits and spread the word. For instance, in America, we have some family leave problems. A very small percentage of men who are eligible for family leave actually take that leave. Some reasons for not taking that are listed here. Some companies have tried things to normalize leave. Among these are unlimited vacation time with varying degrees of success. I'm more in favor of mandatory vacation. Every year, some amount of time must be taken. Of course, here in Europe, there's generally a different vacation culture than we have in the US. I hope your good example spreads to my country. Sometimes what needs to be shared is a boring chore. Maybe your office has a dishwasher. Maybe not. Maybe you drink the unlimited coffee. Maybe you only drink bottled water and juice cleanses. Whatever you're doing at work, of course, having a tidy space makes life easier for everyone. And if someone needs to water a plant or wash a large dish, having a sink full of dishes makes that a lot harder and slower. So taking 10 seconds to wash a cup or two seconds to put it in the dishwasher can save that time for a colleague. Women are often quietly expected to do this cleaning work, no matter how senior a position they hold in a company. 
The most obvious solution is to have everyone clean up after themselves immediately on the honor system. But perhaps what we need to do is install iterations of the first webcam. Some of you might remember that that was used to keep track of whether a coffee pot was full or not, so that if you wanted to get up from your desk, you could just go get a fresh hot cup of coffee without having to brew a new cup. But instead of tracking coffee pots, we could track coffee cups. I want spaces where appreciation is genuine and everyone acknowledges that there is room for improvement. So here in the middle is a good time to take a moment to thank the members of the Postgres core team for encouraging and supporting diversity for all of us. I also want to thank the members of the relatively new Code of Conduct Committee for all of the work that they do. It's a, yeah. It's also especially important to me to thank the organizers of this conference and the selection committee for encouraging new speakers like myself and some others on the panel here. For all of us who are already doing something, and I do believe that's everyone in this room, let's remember that there's more to do and that some people might resent our efforts. Just as we keep working on our buggy code, we have to iterate through our process of working with and making space for everyone around us. This community, in working to nurture safe spaces, must not let underrepresented groups do all the work. Most importantly, working to include more people does not deserve thanks. Expecting appreciation for speaking up is a path to disappointment. So if you're not compelled to thank me, I won't take it personally. And what kinds of activities do I want to discourage in the spaces that I use? I want to prescribe the telling of jokes that depend on race, disability, ethnicity, gender, or age to be funny, because they're hurtful. And I want to replace them with humor about the weather, our great or terrible commutes, our robot overlords. I want to interrupt statements that dismiss the abilities or beliefs of entire classes of people. I'd like to see less pressured alcohol consumption. Alcohol is often used as an excuse for bad behavior and space invasion, and not the video game. Here are some other reasons that people might drink less, or not at all. Make sure that nobody is being pressured to drink at your events. Think about how hard it would be to change group behavior when someone new joins. Will your group blame the new person for this change? And would that be fair to the new person? We often have issues arise in well-established groups when a new person joins. And sometimes that new person might bring to the attention of the group that something's going on. And it's very, very common historically to receive pushback. These are some things that people hear when they try to change a situation. There are more. I'd like to have this be replaced by the phrase, Thank you for letting me know. We have a process to deal with this. I can explain it, and then we can move forward. So now that we've talked a little bit about what we do and don't want in our spaces, it's time to think about who is on the front line of creating and doing the work for these spaces. Of course, we have the Postgres Diversity Committee in the United States. I think it's important to say that this committee did help fund my trip to Postgres EU conference in Lisbon in October as an educational opportunity, and that was really great. We, of course, here have Postgres women. Uh, watch your New York news for Postgres women to be launching there. As I mentioned before, we have the Postgres core team the Postgres Code of Conduct Committee, 
there's company leadership. All of your bosses are doing something to be more inclusive. And hopefully, they'll continue doing more. Of course, there's also everyone in this room. So it's important that we talk a little bit about some studies, some more studies. So the Harvard Implicit Bias Study is a long-running study that talks about how people feel in spaces about the people around them. And I encourage you to follow the link on the slides online to those studies. We also have blind auditions, which is where musicians uh, in orchestras for a long, long time were men. And in the order to encourage women to join, a curtain was placed in front of the audition space to anonymize these auditions. But it turned out that men and women wear different shoes. And you can hear the differences in women's footsteps as they walk across the stage, however obscured their bodies and faces might be. So what was done to further improve the gap was to put down carpeting. And I think that's really great. Hiring became more egalitarian. And I want to join spaces where iterative problem solving like this is used. When an imperfect solution is improved by adding carpet. So again, who is on the front lines of these spaces? So many people. As we know, it's better to have a system in place to handle a situation before it occurs, and it's better to have people doing the work before it needs to be done. Of course, there is no before. It always needs to be done. Members of underrepresented groups are on the front lines of creating new groups when we see a need, but we shouldn't be asked to take new spaces and defend them with our elbows out as Amy Cuddy would have us do. Because I am a member of overrepresented groups as well as underrepresented groups, this is especially visible to me. When queer groups or groups of people of color or groups of women meet, it should not be seen as a threat to the community. While it may sound contradictory, mainstream groups that don't actively welcome all interested members are a threat to underrepresented groups. In the long term, that behavior is also a threat to the stability of the original group. As I said previously, inclusion helps in a number of ways, improving creativity, improving products, making people feel welcome, attracting and retaining better candidates and employees. So I want to thank you all for being here, and I want to encourage you to continue helping in this work. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Renee? I'm happy to answer any questions. If you're not comfortable asking them now, we can... Oh, yes, in the back. Hello. Uh, yesterday, I counted uh, female contributors to Postgres. Thank you. And there are zero in the core team. I think there are zero in the you, uh, good contributors, and there are about two or four in total, over 100 people. So how do you think we can improve that? Well, I've been working for about the last year doing QA in a Postgres workplace. So I think the best things to do are to nurture those of us who are working with Postgres. I myself don't code in C, so contributing to the core of Postgres isn't an activity for me. But you certainly can encourage the women that you know who are working in Postgres to come give talks about problems that they've solved or problems that they haven't solved but want help working on. Encourage people of color and encourage really everybody that you meet to get out and give a talk. And definitely encourage your workplaces to hire a more diverse set of employees. Because I think having, having more at the bottom is a great place to start, but we've got to all collectively push each other forward. That's where I would start. Does anybody have any other questions? 
Vic's got a microphone. He loves using it. Yes. Uh, hi, thank you. Um, I was wondering like, what members of underrepresented groups can also do to kind of include themselves in spaces, and what behaviors would prevent that from being as easy as it could be? When you ask about behaviors, I'm sorry, do you mean behaviors of people with under represented identities or I mean, behaviors? just in your experience, like what can we do as well? Oh, okay, so I mean, I'm, I'm launching Postgres Women in New York. So <laughs> I mean, start a group, welcome, welcome the people around you. The, um, yeah, re reaching out and making it known that there is a space available is a great way to attract people. All of the women's meetups that I go to have very often 50 to 100 people attending because there's such a hunger to be welcomed and such a need for comforting safe spaces where we can take some risks that aren't necessarily allowed of us in, in broader, more mixed spaces. Um, there's a lot of uh, what's called a need to be twice exceptional. If you're the only person of color or the only woman or the only openly gay person in the space, you're exceptional in that one way. You are an exception. We're all white except the Asian person, or we're all straight except this one openly queer person. We're all men except Renee. So, and then that second level of exceptionality is always knowing the right answer. And so it can be very hard to speak up and say, I don't understand, or I have a question, or I think that this is a good way to do it, but I need help building on it. There's that pressure to, if you're not perfect already, don't start. So we've, we've got to be willing to be wrong, and we've got to get ourselves into spaces where it's OK to be wrong. Um, there's a great saying that if there's something worth doing, it's worth doing badly. Because the only way that you learn how to do things better is by messing up, and often for a very long time. So having, having that space to say, it looks like a dog's dinner, which means terrible and gross, but it can get better. Did that answer your question? I think, I think too long didn't read is just show up, which is hard. It's very hard. I think I've got time for one more, if there's anybody. Thank Anyone? you. Thank you.